Synthetic Intelligence Forum Online. My name is Vic, and I'm happy to welcome you to this session. Very happy to be joined by uh, Sebastian German, who joins us from Google. Uh, he has a PhD in computer science from Harvard, and today he's going to talk about uh, his research, which looks into human AI collaboration for natural language generation with interpretable neural networks. Uh, Sebastian has um, a very broad uh, research background. He's looked at many different aspects of uh, of, of neural networks and deep learning. I, I looked at some of his papers on visualizing RNNs and some very interesting insights that are presented therein. So without further ado, Sebastian, I'm going to welcome you to the Synthetic Intelligence Forum and I'm going to put your slides on the screen and uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Well, thanks for inviting me and thanks for the introduction, Vic. I'm super excited to talk about my thesis research uh, today that I did over the last couple of years. And Really, before I jump into the deep end, I want to motivate why, why we actually want to have this human AI collaboration for language generation. And a lot of these insights don't just apply to language generation, but more, uh, are more applicable to all kinds of AI that we're using in products nowadays. So before I jump in, let me uh, set up the, a little scenario where we have Jesse, who is a journalist, and Jesse has a ton of work. Now, a machine learning engineer comes along and says, hey, we can automate part of that. Let us introduce Irene, who is a text generation model. And maybe Irene can help alleviate some of Jesse's burden of work. So Jesse could give some of the workload to Irene. And doing so, Jesse would naturally give up the agency over that part of work. And Irene would fully autonomously generate text. Now, it would be great if it worked that way, but unfortunately, Irene is biased and makes a lot of mistakes. So Jesse still needs to provide oversight over its work, which can actually lead to the point where Jesse ends up with more work than before, because now, in addition to doing all the work, they also have to over, uh, oversee all of the work that Irene is doing and double check everything, uh, which in the end could actually end up being more work. So how do we actually address this issue? Well, we can uh, conceive a scenario in which Irene and Jesse are actually collaborating to do the work. So now Jesse could gain the benefits of automation without actually losing the agency over the work that is being fully automated. What does it mean to collaborate with Irene? Well, let us imagine the goal to be some kind of dialogue forth and back where Irene comes up with an initial suggestion, which is some kind of generated text, and then it explains its suggestion to Jesse, who can then provide some kind of fine-grained feedback on the text, similar to how you would collaborate with another human writer. Then Irene would incorporate this kind of feedback and update the suggestion to Jesse, who can then decide to accept or give another uh, round of feedback. So through this discourse, you can arrive at an accepted solution that is uh, great for Jesse without having to rewrite everything that Jesse is doing explicitly. Instead, all that Jesse has to do is to provide some kind of feedback. So let us go through an explicit example of this. And in this example that I'm going to use throughout this entire talk, Jesse and Irene want to collaboratively summarize a document. So naturally, Irene is trained to be a summarization model and obviously has an idea of how to summarize the document. Jesse, who is a subject matter expert, obviously also has an idea how to summarize it. However, they might not have the same idea. Now, if Irene was human, it could communicate its reasoning. But unfortunately, predictions from neural networks are not interpretable. So if you want to visualize the internals of some uh, network that produces text, you will get something like this, where you have a high dimensional vector of states that change over time as you see one word after the other, which to a human is not very intuitive. Well, instead, we need to build models that can explain the reasoning process such that an explainee, in this case, Jesse, can understand. So for us, we can take the example of uh, Irene explaining, I picked this phrase because it was the most salient to the entire article and I want to include it. And Jesse can then incorporate, feed, uh, give feedback, but even if Irene could explain the suggestion, that doesn't mean that it can necessarily incorporate this kind of feedback. So what we have in terms of this discourse that is our ultimate goal 
is we can't even explain the suggestion. Even if we could, Jesse can not provide any kind of feedback. So we have identified two necessary conditions to have this kind of collaborative work. We need interpretable models that can explain the reasoning process. And we need controllable models that can update the reasoning process based on human feedback. So that the discourse can look more like, I picked this phrase because it was the most salient to the article. And Jesse can say, how about this phrase instead? Which would then override the internal reasoning process for Irene, who can then adapt the suggestion instead of having to rewrite it from scratch. So throughout this talk today, I'm going to talk about four different aspects of this. First, I'm going to give a little bit of a background so that everyone can have the necessary understanding of the notation I'm going to use and the model I'm going to talk about. Then I'm going to talk about how to incorporate a content selection mechanism into a summarization model. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about how human interactivity can lead to understanding predictions from these models. And finally, I'm going to loop around and talk about collaboration with the model to summarize. So starting with the background, let's uh, go to the very basic, where we have a problem where we want to predict the next word, given the context. In this case, our context is a token or a word y1, which is the. And our goal is to predict the second word y2. In our case, it could be small. Now, the next uh, token that we need to predict is y3, given the context the small. Dog owns a yellow ball, which could be the entire string. The way that this is typically uh, notated is that we want to predict the word or the token yt plus 1, given the context of y1 through yt. This is also called language modeling. Now, in the world of uh, neural networks, what is typically being done is that each of these words is embedded into a high dimensional vector called the embedding, so that each of these words has an individual representation, which is then fed into a recurrent neural network, or more recently, a transformer network, which works a little bit differently, but it doesn't really matter to how we're going, uh, approaching these problems today. But in the world of recurrent neural networks, we're going to feed in the first token or the embedding of the first token to get a so-called contextual representation. And this contextual representation is then also the input to the next prediction step. So that the representation or the contextual representation for small both uses the embedding of small and the contextual representation of the. Similarly, if we want to get the contextual representation of dog, we have both the embedding of dog and the contextual representation of the small. And this continues until we have a representation of the entire sequence. Now, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk, uh, ignore the embedding space and simply say that each word is embedded into a contextual representation. From each of these contextual representation to get the actual next word prediction, we're going to have another transformation that takes the contextual representation and maps it onto our known vocabulary. These vocabularies are typically around the size of 50,000 words, which encompasses all of the English language in this our example. But it can also be a multilingual vocabulary for other tasks. But so with going from this high dimensional vector of the onto a probability distribution that incorporates all of the 50,000 words known to the model, uh, known to the model. In our case, it might be that small is actually the highest probability word. So if we pick the next uh, word based on the highest probability, we're actually going to get the correct one. Now, in uh, natural language generation, what we actually want to do is often to also condition on some kind of source sentence. To give you a concrete example, here I'm going here I'm showing this for a an example of English to German machine translation where we have a source x1 through x8, which is our sentence, the small dog owns a yellow ball, and the target y1 through y8, which is the same sentence, but translated into German. So our objective, instead of predicting the next token given our context, we now have also the condition on x, which is our source, so that our uh, objective becomes the prediction of the next token given the context and the source. Filling in the example of uh, 
of the slide, the next the probability of the next word could be predicted as uh, p of next word given der kleine, which is the small, and the context, the small dog owns a yellow ball. The way we're going to represent this throughout the talk and the way it is usually done is a so-called encoder-decoder model. An encoder-decoder model uses the same idea of contextual representations as I uh, explained for just language modeling. Except for the encoder, what we're going to do is to encode something with a bidirectional model, where each word is encoded first with only the left context, and then again with only the right context. And these two representations are then concatenated to get a bidirectional representation. We then also have a separate decoder, which is our standard language model formulation, where uh, the, each word knows about the left context. To combine those two, we are going to use something called an attention mechanism, which is a probability distribution from a token and the decoder over all of the tokens in the encoder. In our case, we might uh, predict an attention distribution that is highest a dog because the decoder has learned that following uh, the translation of the small should be the translation of dog. Now to get the final distribution over our vocabulary, in this case, our German vocabulary, we're simply uh, first going to encode the attention into a context, uh, which is simply a weighted average of our encoder representations weighted by their attention weights. So that we have the sum from S equals one through S, in our case, one through eight, um, of the attention weight, which is a bounded value between zero and one, times the vector that represents each of these words. And then we're simply going to do the same kind of transformation that we did for language modeling, except we're also considering the context vector. And the resulting distribution will then hopefully uh, put most of the probability mass on the correct word, in our case, hund, which is the translation of dog. So this is all of the background I'm really going to need for the uh, next section, which is incorporating content selection into a summarization model. Now, in this case, we have an abstractive summarization problem where our input is a sequence of tokens, again, denoted as y1 or x1 through xs. And then we have a summary y1 through yt. The specialty about abstractive summarization is that the words in the input and the source uh, in, uh, and the summary don't necessarily completely overlap. This is compared to extractive summarization, which is a, a mechanism by which we simply extract the most important sentences in an input. So really, we have a, a text generation problem because we have to choose which words to include at each time step. And then we train a summarization model, similar to how I explained it on the previous slide, to maximize the probability of the summary given the input. Now, we have an additional particularity for summarization because we're actually sharing our vocabulary between the encoder and the decoder. And not only that, we're also actually sharing a lot of the same words. So in this case, taking again our uh, sentence, the small dog owns a yellow ball, we might want to summarize it as dog owns ball. So we can now see that the attention is actually already focused on the correct next word. And we actually just want to copy it instead of having to choose the correct next word from the 50,000 words that our model knows. Instead, we only have to pick the correct word based on all of the eight words that are in the input, which is a much easier problem. And that is the uh, idea behind the so-called copy mechanism, that we can directly use the attention distribution as our distribution over the next uh, word. Now, obviously, it doesn't work all the time. And sometimes we want to generate words that are not included in the input. For example, if we want to paraphrase something or if we connect uh, different phrases. So the way that the copy mechanism addresses this issue is by introducing a binary switch that determines whether the model wants to copy or generate at each of these time steps of generation. And we have, the, uh, therefore, a, a decoupling of our probability distribution, p of y t plus 1, given x and y 1 through t, into these two parts, where one is the probability of copying 
times the uh, copy uh, distribution plus the probability of not copying, so generating, times our distribution over the entire vocabulary. Or if we want to put this in math, we can simply reuse our attention and our standard model predictions as the two distributions over words. And in order to get the binary soft switch, we simply have to um, compute an additional feature from our decoder hidden state. That will tell us whether we want to copy or generate the next word, or a mix between the two. But now that we have introduced this mechanism to copy, the question is whether we should. Because sometimes if we want a really abstractive summary, we may actually not want to reuse all of the words from the input. Instead, we may want to simply reuse some of the words, but not reuse entire sentences. And when I first started working with these models, what I was thinking is that these models work something like this, where you have a summarizer who is using the copy mechanism to extract just the right amount of text from, uh, from a document and then puts it carefully into a summary. But instead, what the model is learning is not that. Instead, it is more acting like this monster inside of this uh, model where it rips out the entire text so that instead of an abstractive summary, you get more of an extractive summary that rips out entire sentences at once. And this leads to the summaries that look like this, where they extract entire sequences like Angela Merkel and her husband, chemistry professor Joachim Sauer, are spotted on their annual Easter trip to the island of Ischia near Naples. Now, obviously, we don't really want to include all of the details about Angela Merkel's husband and the location of the annual Easter trip if you want a very short and concise summary. So we need to find a way to prohibit this behavior and tell the model that we actually only want important terms and not entire sequences. Or in other words, we need to do something about the problem that models fail at content selection, the selection of the most salient content in a long document. And therefore, we consider this problem of content selection as separate from summarization so that we have two models. We have our summarizer, and then we have our content selector. And here, I'm now going to quickly introduce our content selector. For the content selector, we uh, have, for each of the words, a binary indicator, one or zero, that indicates whether a source word, so a word in our long document that we want to summarize, is actually used in a summary. We can see this a little bit, uh, how it should work on the right, where we on the top, show a document with short and long words, all in gray. And then on the bottom, we have this document annotated in red with words that are occurring in a summary. All we then have to do is train a model to maximize the probability of t given x. And this is a much, much, much easier problem than actually generating, because we don't have to choose from 50,000 words at every time step. Instead, we have to choose for each of the words in a uh, document, simply binary indicator, one or zero. But obviously, this is not something that people usually annotate for when they build large corpora of uh, supervised summarization data. So we need to build our own training corpus. But luckily, we can simply do this from the already supervised data. So on the top, I'm showing a long document that we want to summarize. And on the bottom, a gold standard summary, one that we would use to train a model in the first place. And then we can go over it from left to right. So we can start with big and find that big actually occurs as is in the source document. So we say, OK, great, this is probably copied. Since it is copied, we're going to extend the sequence by uh, one token and say big dog. Big dog also occurs in the source document. We're saying, OK, this is the match. Let's go one further, big dog chases, which no longer occurs. So now we log in the location of big dog in the source document and start over with chases, which also occurs. Great. So we can continue this until we have an annotated source document where each of these uh, outlined words occur in the summary. And this is the longest sequence from left to right in the, the target document, so that we know that these are the longest sequence matches. 
We can then run this very simple algorithm over our entire summarization corpus and build our T from this. And then we can simply build our content selector model. For the paper that I'm summarizing here, we built a content selector based on a model called ELMO, which at the time was the best performing model, but now we have other means that we could also use alternatively. But now that we have two models, we have our content selector and we have our summarizer, we need to incorporate them somehow. And we do this by restricting what the summarization model can actually copy. We can simply tell it, don't copy anything that our content selector masked out. Or to be more precise, let us first denote the selection probability from the content selector as QS. So basically, every source token, x1 through uh, xs, has a probability assigned to it corresponding to how important our content selector thinks it is. And then we define a second uh, a quantity, an importance threshold, epsilon. And this can be something you choose based on how many of the words you actually want to allow the model to copy. Empirically, this often is around 0.15 to 0.2, where anything above an important score of 0.2 out of 1 is important enough to be included in the summary. And then all we have to do really is to modify the copy attention of a trained summarization model to set the copy attention to 0 whenever QS for a token is uh, smaller than epsilon, or simply our new copy attention score, A tilde, is uh, A whenever QS of the corresponding source token is greater than epsilon. I want to also simply illustrate how this looks like. In our case, our content selector might have found that this small and A are all not important to the entire summary. Therefore, when we predict the next token from after dog owns, we're not looking at D or A anymore because they're simply getting an attention score of zero. Instead, we can focus on the actually predicted uh, tokens, dog and ball. And in this case, ball is still the highest probability word. But since we have also renormalized our distribution after zeroing out values, it has now has a much higher probability. We can simply add this to any given model. So we, in our paper that I'm summarizing, we added this to two different architectures, and we evaluated across two different data sets. And other people since have evaluated across other similar tasks and found that this is a very consistent improvement to a model with very, very simple overhead. Because all you have to do is train a simple sequence tagger that identifies these binary ta tags for each of the tokens. And then you can apply it to any model. So great. We can say that we can improve summarization by taking a little bit of a closer look into the structure of the problem. And also, if you look at the qu uh, qualitative out output, the long sentence that I was mentioning earlier, if you run it uh, with the new model, you can actually see that it uh, removes the two extra sequences that we didn't want, the chemistry professor Joachim Sauer and the location of the annual Easter trip. But my original plan for this talk is to talk about the generation of a summary that is collaborative between a human. And this does not intrinsically make it collaborative. All it does is it improves the automatic model. So how do we do this? And before I go into detail on how to do this, I also want to now talk about uh, the background for understanding predictions through interactivity, because we need this to understand how we can interact with the model. And before I even go into this, let's take an even higher level look at what it actually means to be interpretable and collaborative for a model. For example, look at who could be our user of whatever the collaborative system in the end looks like. It could be a model architect. In our case, a model architect is someone like me who builds models, who knows a lot of the ins and outs of a model. And, and I may not know as much as a journalist about the target domain. So what I actually want to look at now is what the model does instead of what the output looks like. But I could also be a model trainer, someone who is maybe in some company who is training a model using downloaded code from the internet and who does not have as deep of an understanding of how the model works, but knows pretty well how to apply it to their target domain. Or I could be an end user 
someone like a doctor in a hospital who looks at generated radiology reports, or someone like Jesse, who is a journalist who wants to summarize an article and knows a lot about summarization. We have to cater our interface to that specific user. And then there's also this uh, target of interpretability that we have to consider. Do we want to understand our model better? Or do we want to understand better what the prediction or the decision of the model looked like? Do we want to look at a simple example of where the model went wrong and understand why it went wrong? Or do we want to find categorical flaws or signals in the model that it has learned? And finally, if we build an interactive interface, how closely coupled do they have to be, the model and the interface? Do we simply want to observe something, which is, for example, seen in TensorBoard or any of these tools that allow you to model, uh, to monitor your model performance over time? You don't have to interact with the model at all. So you can stay completely passive on the model side. Or do we want something like an interactive observation where I can play around and restrict the model a little bit? Or do I want to the full interactive collaboration, which requires changes to the actual model? I want to now give you an example of an interactive tool, but not quite a collaborative tool. And for this, uh, I picked this tool, which uh, we built to debug sequence-to-sequence -sequence models for translation again. And what I want to show with this is that for a model trainer or architect who wants to understand a single decision that went wrong, so a prediction of the model that was not up to the standard that we expected, we can build an interactive tool that allows us to interact with the model and ask counterfactual what-if questions. These what-if questions are incredibly important because they, whenever we change something in a model, a very minimal uh, quantity, we can observe how the output changes. And through that, we can get causal insights into how the model behaves. So going back to this interface, here you can see that on top, in blue, we have our input and our encoder. In the middle, we have this attention, as shown by the ribbons between blue and yellow. In yellow, we have the output. Below the output, we have the top five predictions at each time step. And on the bottom, we have something I haven't mentioned yet, which is the beam search. And I want to focus specifically on the beam search component of this interface. For those of you who don't know, beam search is a way to find solutions if, you, if it's much too complicated to traverse the entire graph. In our case, at each time step, we have to compute 50,000 probabilities. If we want to compute the full scores for all of the sequences of length two, we have 50,000 squared. So it uh, rises exponentially. We obviously can't do this. Similarly, we don't just want to pick the top probability token at each time because that might be suboptimal. So in the medium, we have beam search, which says we expand all of the probabilities of a point, in this case, all over 50,000, and then we prune it to the top n, in our case, three. And then we expand only those three. So now we have 50,000 times three, which is no longer exponential. And again, if we prune it to top three, you can already see that one of these uh, branches is gone. And you can continue until you find the end of a sequence. In our case, it would be, I need water. And then once you have all of your sequences terminated, you can simply look at the top three sequences and their probabilities under the model to pick the best one. But now I can introduce a what-if question. What if the model had predicted the prefix I run instead of I need or you jump correctly? Well, in Beam Search, we can restrict the probability to prefixes. We can simply say, run the Beam Search, but conditioned on the already uh, existing outputs, Y1 and Y2, being equal to I run. And now we can simply run Beam Search again. And through this, we have found this counterfactual whether it, the model predicted the correct sequence if it had gotten I run correctly. This is incredibly powerful and allows us to understand model errors better because we can do these inference time interventions. And inference time interventions is also what will allow us to collaborate with the model to summarize. So this collaboration through intervention and inference time is something we call collaborative semantic inference. And here, the use case I'm going to show you is the one of Jesse, who wants to summarize. 
So Jesse is an end user who wants to understand a single uh, decision or shape this decision in this case. And we do this by using a model that has an interpretable hook or this lever built into it that Jesse can control. So let me explain to you what I mean by interpretable hook in the model with a simple example of a train endpoint predictor. On the left here, we show a simple problem. We have a train at a position, which we call X, and we want to predict where the train will end up. In our case, there's only one endpoint, but you can consider that there's 10 more. So our model is then predicting P of Y given X, where Y is the endpoint. But let's focus on this one decision where uh, uh, prediction where the train endpoint predictor predicts that the train will end up on top of the screen, which is a reasonable assumption given the environment I've set up. As part of this, the predictor has to make this latent decision, this unobserved decision, whether the train goes left or goes right, which we don't know where, uh, where it will go, even though we know where it will end up. Similarly, once the train has arrived at the endpoint, we don't actually know what path the train has taken, because all we can observe is this endpoint. And this is exactly what is happening in your standard black box neural model, where you have an input and you have an output, but you have no idea what's happening in the middle. But what if we can introduce something like a lever that directs the train to the left or the right direction? In this case, we have a train endpoint and path predictor. In our case, the path predictor might predict that the train will go to the right. And if it goes to the right, it will end up at the top, which is still the same output. Similarly, once we observe the train being at the top, we can simply observe the position of the lever given our output and know that the train has taken the right path. This very simple idea also allows us to enable our end user to simply set a prior on the lever position. In this case, the prior could be that the train should never take a left turn, so that P of Z left equals zero. In this case, we restrict the model, even though all we did was interact with this interpretable hook. We have not changed the input in any way. All we do is direct the reasoning of the model. So now let's consider a long document and consider a model similar to the one I described earlier with the bottom-up attention, where for each of the tokens in the input, we have this binary indicator of whether the model is allowed to copy that word or not. Or let's plot it like this, where we have one lever for each of the words in an input. Can we do the same thing as we did with the train now, where we restrict where the model can go? Well, we have to build an interactive interface for this. And this is what we did. Now, this interface is obviously a little bit complicated because a lot of things are going on. But the simple idea is that on the left, we have a long input grouped into sentences. And a blue highlight means that the lever is in the on position. The model is allowed to copy all of the words within that sentence. Then in the middle, we have our P of A tilde, which is our copy attention. But the copy attention for the a prediction, which we show on the right, which is our P of Y given X and Z, where Z in this case is our uh, binary indicators and X is the long input. Or in layman terms, on the right, we show the summary. In the middle, we show where did the summary come from in the document. And then in blue, we show what do I want to use. In addition, we also can show in these red underlines what has been summarized by the model. And that is equivalent to looking at the lever position after observing what the output is. So in this case, we have a separate model that predicts, given the input and the output, which of the words were already summarized. And what we can do with this interface is, for example, to add another sentence. Instead of having to rewrite the entire uh, summary, let's go back one slide. Here on the right, the suggestion by the model is simply three sentences. And Jesse could think, hmm, yeah, that's a pretty good three sentences, but I want to go more into detail about one thing. So Jesse, deselect sentences on the left, shown in those uh, grayed out sentences, 
and then clicks the button Add Sentence, which will run the Beam search in the same way that I just described in the last section, where we simply constrain the Beam search on all the already generated sentences or words. And we also fix the pos um, position of the levers or our binary indicators of what the model is allowed to copy to only those sentences that were activated. Now, if Jesse is not happy with it, Jesse can delete the sentence by clicking on the Delete button on the right and deselect the sentence that was copied and say, I don't actually want you to copy that sentence. And then click Add Sentence again. Great. Now we have another sentence, and Jesse might be happy with that one. But now Jesse wants to go more into depth on one of the aspects of the generated text. So Jesse can start writing her own or their own sentence, the water is dot, dot, dot. And through this power of this interaction and this collaboration, dot, dot, dot actually means to the model, please finish the sentence. And the model will predict and give all of the model internals for the continuation of the sentence. In addition to being able to have this dialogue or forth and back where Jesse gives feedback to the model by restricting, and the model will update its suggestion by adding new sentences or repredicting the entire uh, summary, the model can even give feedback to Jesse. So I told you about these red underlines, which are a prediction of what has been summarized of the input. Now, every time one of the or multiple of the words inside of a sentence have been summarized according to this model, we're going to give it this red outline in the middle uh, bracket, which means that Jesse, on one glance, can actually see how many of the sentences in an input have been summarized with the current summary, so that the model can actually tell Jesse this is how good the coverage of his summary is. And Jesse says, OK, that's great. Um, let's just say this is the summary. So what this section really meant is that collaborative semantic inference can make models collaborative. We can leverage the underlying structure of a problem in our case, through this bottom-up attention mechanism, which can lead to better neural models. We can add interpretable and controllable latent variables, in our case, these binary indicators, that follow the structure. Then we can expose these variables in an interface. And even though we have as many uh, latent variables as we have words in an input, by grouping them together as sentences, we can actually make it reasonable for an end user to manipulate the model reasoning process. And you can imagine the previous interface I've shown you without all of the ribbons, with all, all of the attention uh, work, simply showing here is your, work, uh, your sentences, here is the sentence that have been summarized, and here is the sentences that I want the model to summarize. None of these require extensive training in machine learning. So we can actually design these kinds of interfaces for people to use them, uh, even though they have no background. And what this also allows us uh, to do is to, for end users to retain agency over the automated process. And again, coming back to the beginning of the talk, retaining agency is incredibly important if we have something as critical as generating radiology reports, which is always a great example, because for those, uh, models are actually already being used in production. But what if the radiologist say it doesn't agree with what a model is generating, well, in this case, we need something that uh, interrupts the reasoning process and where the radiologist can give feedback to the model so that we don't end up with wrong radiology reports that potentially cause harm. Now, with that, I want to actually uh, end the talk already and uh, open for questions. I also want to mention that if you're more interested in the aspect of the interpretability of the neural networks, I recently, with two other of my colleagues, gave a tutorial at our ACL, the Association for Computational Linguistics. And uh, we gave an entire three-hour tutorial on interpretability in NLP with all the depth uh, that you would want. So you can simply find that on the web as well. And then uh, thank you for watching, and I'm opening for questions. Thank you, uh, Sebastian. That is awesome. Uh, there's already a couple of good questions here. I'm going to start popping them on the screen for you. So here's an interesting question. So you talked about summarization and translation differently.
Uh, the question is, when you're summarizing into a different language, is the best practice to summarize and then translate? Or is there any gain from trying to combine it into one model? Uh, and is that is that even possible? Yeah, so this is actually more of a problem of data availability than modeling capacity. So there are some data sets that do exactly this, where it is multilingual summarization or multilingual generation, where you have one shared input in one language or maybe a table that you want to summarize, and the output can be any of multiple languages. And obviously, if you want to have a very inclusive research agenda or a very inclusive product, it is always better to include as many languages as you can. And the only restriction really is what kind of data can you have access to. And if you have multilingual data, great, use it directly. But otherwise, obviously, you can always split it into multiple steps where you first summarize and then translate. OK, great. Thank you, Sebastian. Another question here is, uh, is there variance in the summarization? When you were talking about calculating probabilities, uh, when two or more summary uh, words in the, the tokens in the summary have an identical probability, is there any stochasticity in your summarizer? Or is it always deterministic and it's always going to give you the same summary given the same text input? Yeah, so, so this is a very standard uh, summarizer. And as all neural models uh, that do not use any kind of sampling, uh, as part of the modeling pipeline, they are deterministic. So the same input will give you the same summary. What you can change, however, is the way that you sample text. And the only way I talked about this today, which is usually the one that gives you the best scores on your automatic metrics, is beam search, which is an approximate search for the optimal solution. But you can also sample from a proper distribution that is predicted, in which case you would get a, a, a different summary every time you run it. Interesting. Uh, and in fact, then I have a quick follow up question be before I put the next question up, which is, uh, Sebastian, you mentioned at the very end, the tool that you have built to basically involve the human in, in figuring out, in, in interpreting, debugging your model. So I guess one question here is, uh, what if there was to be some stochasticity introduced in that process where, for example, it gives you uh, not just different possible options, but for example, synonymous options. And then actually depending on the one that the human user picks, it almost like in a reinforcement learning sense, then calibrates the model to, to go in that direction in the future. Right, I think you're making two great points here. One is uh, showing multiple suggestions and the other one is using reinforcement learning or other techniques to improve the model based on this feedback. And for the first one, obviously we're like the interface that I showed is a, a demonstration that this technique is possible. And it was, I think, the first of its kind where we simply wanted to make sure people are aware that this technique exists and should be explored more deeply. But obviously, if we wanted to actually improve efficiency of journalists who use this, there is much work to be done. And one of these is definitely showing multiple suggestions or multiple sentences. And there are a lot of ways to generate diverse sequences, for example, through sampling, or there are techniques called diverse beam search, which penalizes every time uh, you use the same branch inside of your beam so that you're basically enforced to create diverse uh, paths to this network. Now to the second question, which is using reinforcement learning to customize the model for yourself. So in the model that I showed, this is all infer uh, inference time only, which means that we're not actually changing any of the model weights, only the model predictions. And this comes back to this categorization that I showed when I talked about understanding the predictions, where you can either have methods that address directly at the model level, or you can uh, target your decision level. And I would categorize something like using human feedback to improve the model more on the model level, because you would not learn from a single example. You would have a, a journalist go through multiple of these examples and then customize it over time. And so that, there has been some work in this area where people use this kind of active learning approach or online learning approach where models are continuously learning from human feedback. But this is incredibly difficult to achieve for text generation because we have this property of discrete sequential decision making. And the human feedback that we're getting is usually on the entire output level where a journalist might say, oh yeah, this is the wrong summary. This is the summary we should have uh, given. And then we can add this as a training example. But where we actually want to go is to have the journalist give a lot more fine-grained uh, feedback, for example, on our latent variable, 
which of this sent these sentences in the input should the model have incorporated, which one's not. And this is something that I think a lot of people are working on at the moment, but there is no one correct solution for this approach at the moment. Okay, thank you. And I think your answer then has two other related questions that have popped up in chat. One of them is, uh, you mentioned Beam Search a couple of times, but what about other algorithms like Monte Carlo Tree Search or something like that? Could they be used or is there a particular reason why you mentioned Beam Search repeatedly? Yeah, so uh, usually Beam Search is used because it is an approximately, like, it's a very fast approximate algorithm that only has a complexity of O of N instead of like O of N uh, exponential. Uh, but obviously you can use any other kind of algorithm. I don't think many people use Monte Carlo tree search because again of its complexity implications, especially for text, because you're, every time you open a branch and you want to explore all the children, you have to compute a softmax over 50,000 which is a standard value, but like 30 to 50,000 uh, words, which makes it incredibly difficult to explore many of these nodes. And for that, we want to use a non-stochastic process because we have a deterministic model. But obviously, if you want to uh, not do this and instead also look at like different ways to uh, generate, we can sample, we can use Monte Carlo, we can use any other kind of sampling mechanism. OK, great, thank you. So here's another question, very practical. So how do you actually evaluate the model or the technique? Yeah, so I don't think you can get around uh, human subject studies in this kind of world. A lot of the work that I've uh, touched upon today is all more broadly categorized as like machine learning and human computer direction, which is very different from your standard like uh, papers that you see for machine learning conferences where you can actually say, OK, this gets a metric of five, which is better than the previous four. Therefore, we have state of the art. This is not possible if you have these kind of interactive interfaces. Instead, we need to ask questions such as, is this useful? Is this useful to anyone? And oftentimes, the, question, the answer is no. Like It's not useful in the way that it was intended to be useful. Going back to this uh, new machine translation debugging tool that I mentioned earlier, we have found that Translators actually really like the top part of the interface, where they can just see what which word comes from what, where it's a simple attention visualization. But they did not like all the other fancy features that I did not mention, where we also have like a KNN search over your training corpus according to your hidden states, which will give you an explanation of what exactly the most similar training examples were uh, to explain why a prediction was made a certain way. This is incredibly cool to me, but it's not very useful to someone like a translator. What these tools often show in the end is either that something is possible, like the last project that I talked about, or that something uh, can be useful in very unintended ways. For example, the uh, seek to seek this, our debugging tool, has been incredibly helpful as a teaching tool. And uh, I know a lot of professors who are using this in their intro to NLP class now to simply show how a sequence to sequence model is working. Well, it was unintended, but obviously this kind of research can be useful because we're getting a step in the right direction and we have other possible potential positive outcomes. Great, thank you. Uh, there's another uh, question, a bit more in the details around your uh, early part of your talk. Uh, so you talked about the value of epsilon and you sort of had some heuristic around what the kind of rule of thumb is, but is there uh, is it language dependent or is there is there some kind of range for across all languages? Yeah, so... Uh, the way we selected our epsilon was to tune on the development set, which is a standard technique where we simply varied a little bit, did a grid search on the perfect hyperparameters, and then selected the one that got us the best results. But there has been a lot of variance even between corpora in the same language, even if the summarization task is actually very similar. So in the paper, in the paper that I summarized, we tried it on two English summarization tasks, the uh, CNN daily mail task, which is the standard summarization corpus, which is not great to be fair, and the New York Times corpus. Both of them have a long input of multiple hundred of, hundreds of words and an output that is around three to five sentences long. And in both cases, we actually got very different uh, perfect values for epsilon. And it will also vary based on how good your content selector is. In our case, it might have only gotten like 80 or 85% correct. But if it is much more confident about the correct results, 
you can potentially set epsilon to 0.7 or 0.8. So yeah, it will vary between different languages. And even between uh, tasks in the same language, there are different types of summarization tasks. So there's also something uh, called headline generation, which is only one sentence summary, which again uses a different one. There's different values based on the content selector and so on. That's why it's really important to tune this value. It's very sensitive to that. But good question, thank you. Great. Uh, just a quick follow-up question before, and we'll do one more question from the chat, but just a side question I wanted to ask you is, Sebastian, uh, in your testing, did you ever maybe try to reconstruct a given input uh, by running your summarizer summarizer backwards? Is there any such kind of test you've done? Is that even possible? Yeah, so that's actually a very standard technique in translation, where it's a little bit more of a one-to-one -one mapping. You can see summarization more of a lossy compression, where you're obviously losing a lot of information along the way. And people are actually doing this. There has been a recent paper from last year that did uh, backward summarization with pretty good results. Not perfect, obviously, because you're losing information. Sure. But in translation, it's called uh, this technique is called back translation. And it's uh, typically used to generate more training data, where you want to leverage multiple million data points that you have only in English, but you want to uh, translate from English to Tamil. And you don't have enough data for Tamil, so you're training on English to Tamil for the data you have, then you're running your English to Tamil model, and suddenly you have a lot of data that is noisy, but better than nothing. So that's a very standard technique, yeah. Okay, thank you. We'll do one last question, a very practical question too, in terms of the user, which is a journalist. Uh, do you ever envision model customization that would allow a journalist to train the model on their own writing style? Yeah, so uh, I think, if we actually have these kinds of controllable models, it will get much, much easier than if we don't. And one of the side effects of having these discrete latent variables is that they, the models are very, very small. And they can be trained on very, very little data. So that's actually a great question. So in, in our paper, we have uh, a, an evaluation of how many annotated data training points do you need to train a good content selector? And we found that with just 100 data points, you get this almost the same uh, performance as with 100,000 data points. So if you're a journalist who wants to customize their content selection, at least, you can, if you have written 100 summaries within this kind of way, you can train your own. Whereas if you were to actually uh, try and write your own summaries and then add these to the training corpus to do customization, you would have to retrain your model, which can take weeks and is a very, like effortful uh, process and might not actually work because you're only adding 100 data points to the corpus of 300,000. So yeah, this is a very lightweight way for customization. Great. Uh, thank you, Sebastian, for your time. This was a great presentation. Thank you for engaging with our community members in questions and answers. Uh, but it, it's pretty clear that this is still a, I mean, you've done some great work, but this is still a very fast growing area for research. So lots of opportunities for colleagues to maybe pick up the ball and sort of run it forwards in any of these areas which you described from sort of the content selection to the summarization, to the translation, to the actual visualization and that full feedback loop with the human in the chain. So really great. And we hope to have you back uh, in a couple of months, Sebastian, to come and uh, give us a bit of an update on the state of the art from yourself or from other researchers. Yes, happy to. And thank you for inviting me again. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye.